Good morning, everyone, and welcome to part six of our Charlotte Coming Through the Decades virtual program. Uh, as you know, we've been covering the history of Charlotte County's 100 years over the last few months. Uh, and as I've said in the last couple months, we're, we're kind of getting there. We're almost a little bit halfway through. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the 1970s. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot that's going on in the 1970s. And uh, it, it was really hard for me to nail down something in particular to talk about with you all today. And so I thought that this would be a little bit of a potpourri lecture. Uh, and so I'm going to cover several things that were going on in the 1970s um, from development to... Uh, a new bridge and, and a couple things in between. All right, so let's go ahead and get going here. So what I'd like to start with is the opening of Rotunda West. Uh, and so just to give a little bit of background, and I don't want to do too much here, if you want to know more, I would highly encourage that you read Jason Buick's Swamp Peddlers. Uh, he gets all he gets into this development and other developments uh, in uh, Southwest Florida and other parts of Florida in much greater detail. But just very quickly, for our purposes today, um, in 1951, 25,000 acres in Cape Hayes are, is bought by the Vanderbilt brothers, uh, William and Arthur. Uh, and they are going to create the 2V Ranch. Uh, and they will have that um, for several years. Uh, and in 1958, they're going to sell 10,000 of those acres to the Mackles, you recall from our video a couple of times ago, I believe in the 1950s, we talked uh, about the Mackle brothers and, and that early development of Port Charlotte. Um, so 10,000 acres of that 25,000 acres will be sold to them in 1958 as an extension of Port Charlotte. And then in 1968, 1969, the rest of the land is sold by the Vanderbilts to Joe Klein of Kavanaugh uh, Corporation, for $19.5 million. And this is the land that will eventually become part of Rotunda West. Um, and in September of 1970, the land uh, that was bought was formally released, or part of it was released for development. Um, and I have here, this is actually from the clerk of court, and these, are, these records are available online, so I would highly encourage you to check that out. Uh, and so you can go through here and you can read this document that talks about the release of the land uh, for the opening of Rotunda West. And so we're talking about, uh, you know, it says here, land in Charlotte County, Florida, described as, and then it goes through the various segments, right? Uh, anyone who has seen Rotunda West from the air knows that it looks like a big pie. And each of those pieces um, is described here. So the Broadmoor segment, the Long Meadow segment, the Oakland Hills segment, right? And so these are released uh, for development uh, and uh, open for housing uh, in 1970. Now, we don't have time to talk about it. Um, Jason does a great job, and I'll just give you a little teaser here. Um, and maybe those of you that live out in Rotunda West know some of the difficulties uh, that that community has faced. And so, long story short, Joe Klein is not really interested in fully developing Rotunda West. Um, he's a swamp peddler, as, as Jason talks about. Uh, and so they are going to be brought before, they, lawsuits are going to be brought forth against Joe Klein and against Kavanaugh communities by the residents of Rotunda West who essentially, you know, buy these homes or buy these lots and, and these homes that are built terribly um, and there's, you know, no transportation, there's no infrastructure, etc. So just to give you a little, a little taste here. So Kavanaugh's charges were a litany of swamp peddling perfidiousness. Among the lowlights, they have failed to give buyers property reports and are offering statements as required by law. They have touted the value of the property as increasing when they knew buyers would be unable to get what they paid for it or even sell it at all, and had lied by saying that Kavanaugh would, if requested, buy the property back. Salesmen had also claimed that residents could access the Gulf by boat through Rotunda West Canal System when they couldn't. And the General Electric Company had planned and designed the community when all it had done was sell the developer appliances. And it goes on and on. Uh, and so again, we don't have time to talk about this in depth, but I would highly recommend Jason's book. And you can read all about the interesting uh, development and, and or lack of development uh, in Rotunda West. So that's in September of 1970. And, and the situation at Rotunda West is going to go on throughout the 1970s. In October of 1970, the 
old Punnagorda Herald, which is now in the 1970s the Herald News, uh, goes daily. Um, this becomes a daily paper. And one of the reasons, right, so it says here, I sincerely hope that all the people of the county, residents, men, residents and businessmen and women will take advantage of this new local daily paper and give it the support it deserves. So everyone is super excited about this going daily. Um, and, and you can see this is front page news uh, in October, October 4th, 1970. Uh, it is interesting that one of the reasons that it goes daily, and you can uh, look at the microfilm at Mid County Regional Library and see this for yourself, is the ads. Um, I cannot tell you how many pages and pages of ads there are once it becomes a daily. So you almost long for the days when it was just a weekly paper. Now, in 1971, April of 1971, 50 years ago, Charlotte County celebrates its 50th anniversary. Uh, so here we are in 2021 celebrating the 100th anniversary of Charlotte County. Well, in 1971, they're celebrating the 50th. And it was a big deal. Um, the Herald News, right, so you have this full uh, broadside. Hopefully you can see this here. It is pretty large lettering, right? 1921, that was the year that saw the birth of Charlotte County, saw the completion of the old bridge over Charlotte Harbor, saw the establishment of the city manager form of government. And you can see it all in the Daily Herald News Golden Anniversary Mail Away Progress Edition, Friday, April 23rd. So not only is this promoting Charlotte County's history, but it is also a sales pitch too. You can see coupons down here to purchase subscriptions to the newspaper if you didn't already have them. Uh, and the nice thing about this edition um, and I'm not going to go through all of it here with you, but the nice thing is, is that they reprint some of the headlines from 1921. So the front page of the April 23rd, 1921 Punta Gorda Herald is reprinted in this special edition. And then they kind of just go through and they talk about different elements of Charlotte County's past. Uh, some of the headlines, Harbor was rebel hideaway during civil war. So talking about how long of a history Charlotte County has had, and, and I believe I've mentioned that in some of the videos over the past year. Ex-pirate retired in Charlotte area, right? There's all sorts of stories about pirates and things uh, with Charlotte Harbor. Um, and even, right, advertisements. So the Port Charlotte Bank, right? And Char Port Charlotte Bank and Charlotte County are both celebrating anniversaries this year, right? So promoting this progress, promoting this growth. And then here, uh, we salute Charlotte County's 50 years of progress, everyone at Port Charlotte Shopping Plaza, right? Then of course, there's all sorts of specials and there's all sorts of deals, um, you know, and, and for those of us, you know, if you've ever bought anything, 4th of July sales or Labor Day sales, right? Memorial Day sales, well, that's not a new, that's not a new trick of the trade. They've, they've been doing that a very long time. Now in December of 1971, so right at the end of that 50th anniversary year, um, we're going to have a bit of an environmental disaster here in Charlotte County. And last year, last December, uh, Ashley and I were out uh, at Harbor Heights and we talked about the uh, phosphate spill uh, of December 1971. But I wanted to go through it again a little bit here, not in, not in huge depth, um, but just to remind uh, everyone and to talk about a couple things. You know, this is not the first phosphate spill that had impacted the Peace River or Charlotte Harbor uh, when this occurs. Um, and it, you know, it is a huge problem. You can see here, slime spill near Charlotte Harbor. Um, and so the first, and legal action pens, right? So this, this is a very serious matter, both environmentally, but also uh, legally as well. And the first paragraph says, a break in a phosphate slime retention wall at the city service phosphate division processing plant southwest of Fort Meade dumped two billion gallons of the soupy gray substance into the Peace River Friday, giving rise to fears of a massive, massive fish kill in the river. And in fact, there was going to be a mass, massive fish kill. Um, later on, two days later, uh, the, Her the Herald News reports lawsuits considered in phosphate spill and that it hurts the tourist trade, right? The slime tide from phosphate waste reached Charlotte Harbor and passed under the Baron Collier Bridge today. Right? Ed H uh, Hendrickson Jr., owner of Gulf Shores Seafood and one of the area's major producers of crab meat, said the slime will probably put us out of the crab meat business. It put us clean out when it happened in 1967 and we had to haul crabs from F North Florida. 
This looks worse because the water never turned color below the bridge. So from that short little paragraph, right, we're getting a sense that this phosphate spill perhaps was not only worse in terms of size, right, but, but impacted the Peace River and, and came to Charlotte Harbor in a way that it had not uh, before. And there are other articles that will show, uh, they have photos and, and, you know, unfortunately, as you can see, the photos, when we're looking at it on microfilm, we can't really see the photos, they don't come out very well. Um, but there are other um, articles that sh people are holding up dead fish. Uh, so this is a huge, huge problem. Now, on December 13th, 1971, uh, there's a bit of an opinion column, and it's on the front page. Uh, it says, man in the street, can we prevent phosphate spills? Recently, a phosphate spill in invaded the placid waters of Charlotte County, and a large fish scale has been predicted. Since this is the fourth major phosphate spill in the last 10 years, four spills in 10 years. So imagine what's that, what that's doing to the Peace River. Uh, to Charlotte Harbor, and to people who rely on these waters for a living, right? The fishing industry, while in the 1970s, it may not have been what it was, say, in the 1920s, or, or even in the latter part of the 19th century, but it is still very important, and it is still the livelihood of a lot of people in this area, right? So they're soliciting opinions, right? Can this be prevented, right? And they, they interview several people here. And so one person says, says, uh, the phosphate trouble has been going on for 30 years. Do the phosphate companies dig test holes to find out if the phosphate is seeping under their dams? That's where the phosphate is coming from. Phosphate is heavier than water, so it goes to the bottom of the pits, and when the pressure becomes too great, it pushes through. Uh, so you're not just interviewing you know, people who are saying, oh, there's a big gray sludge that's going by. These people understand how uh, environment and, and to businesses, right? It's not just killing fish or even perhaps birds or, or other amphibians, um, but it's killing people's business as well. And, and some of the opinions in here, people, you know, are very, you know, feel very strongly. Somebody says, yes, they should, the state should definitely make them do something. Phosphate spills are detrimental to fishermen as well as uh, mal uh, malaria, uh, um, and the phosphate companies just pay a relatively small fine and forget about the destruction they have caused. So this is not just an answer to the question, can we prevent phosphate spills? This is also saying the state needs to do something and these companies need to be held accountable. Uh, and if you think about the 1970s, right, uh, this is a time where we see, you know, the EPA, we see the Clean Water Act, we see a growing awareness uh, throughout the country uh, regarding the environment, regarding what humans do to the environment, uh, and, you know, to, to make a profit and everything. And it, and it is a difficult issue. Um, I would recommend that you check out um, the video that we did from last December, um, you know, because this is, this is a difficult issue and, and it's certainly understandable to see both sides of it where people need to make a living, but it's also impacting the environment. How do we, how do we balance that? All right. So 1970, 1971, now we're gonna skip ahead to 1976. This is the bicentennial year. So this is an exciting time, not just for Charlotte County, but for the nation at large, right? The country is celebrating 200 years since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In Charlotte County, they are planning to celebrate that, um, but they are also uh, planning for the opening of the new bridge across uh, the Peace River. So. If you recall some of uh, my past videos, we've talked about the evolution of bridges across the Peace River, right? We talked about the one in 1921, the very first bridge. Uh, and then we talked about the first Baron Collier Bridge in 1931, right? So that 1931 Baron Collier Bridge is the only bridge across the Peace River from 1931 until 1976. It is the sole bridge. And, and, you know, I think for those first few decades, the 40s, the 50s, and even into the 60s, it's okay. But by the 19, you know, by the late 1960s, early 1970s, it does appear that something needs to be adjusted. And, and what they determine is that rather than just having a single span, we need two spans, right? And the idea is to do a northbound span 
all right, and a southbound span. And so that's where this comes into play. So the original 1931 Barron Tyler Bridge is going to remain for now, and then they are going to build this second one uh, to take the load off. And so here, this is on May 14th in 1976. It says, bridge ceremony planned. Special activities are planned for a July 4th ceremony dedicating the new bridge over the Peace River. Project Chairman Dave Johnson said anyone interested in participating should contact him or the Chamber of Commerce, which will act as a clearinghouse for the event. Uh, and they are planning on dignitaries. Um, they have some of the local historians, U.S. Cleveland, Vernon Peoples, who are going to be um, putting on historic lectures, talking about the history of the bridges uh, with photos and, and things like that. And, you know, it's not coincidental this is going to happen on July 4th. And it's not just because it's the bicentennial year, right? If we go back, and if you recall, when was the 1921 and the 1931 bridge dedicated? On July 4th. So they are going to dedicate this on July 4th as well. Just so happens that it's also the bicentennial year. So it's going to be a, a, big, a big July uh, in 1976. And so in addition to these, uh, art these articles on the bridge, you're also going to see information on the bicentennial events. So here, Charlotte County will have a courthouse full of employees wearing 1776 costumes, working in offices decorated in 1776 theme for the week before the big 4th of July bridge dedication and during the week of the countywide bicentennial exhibit and display at Charlotte County Memorial Auditorium, right? So, you know, this is, again, it's going to be a big event and, and certainly the bridge is part of that as well. Here, this is uh, June, uh, no, this is still May, uh, my apologies. Um, says that the program is buried, right, for the dedication event. A parade, motorcade, and historical speeches highlight activities planned July 4th for the dedication of the new bridge over the Peace River. Uh, and there's an image up here, I'll, I'll hold it up. I mean, it's hard to see, of course, as I said, but um, so you have this, this committee, you have putting all together for the 4th of July bridge dedication activities, are David Johnson chairman and then other folks as well who are planning the parade, the fish fry, the dedication ceremonies, uh, numbers by choral groups, so there's going to be a musical component of course, and then the bicentennial band. And anyone was welcome to participate. Um, so they were going to have boats going down the Peace River, it was going to be all sorts of things. In June, this is mid-June, June 16, 1976, um, word arrives that Albert Gilchrist, who the bridge is going to be named for, uh, and we'll talk about that in just one minute, um, it turns out that his niece, uh, Gilchrist was a bachelor, but you know he had siblings who had children, um, and his niece is planning to attend. So the article says, a niece of former governor Albert W. Gilchrist, Bessie Holloway of Maryland, will be in Charlotte County July 4th for the dedication of a new bridge named for her uncle. So that's exciting, right? Um, again, for you know, for someone that had no children uh, and who is now going to be uh, the name of this new bridge, uh, it was exciting that there were family members that would come. Uh, and then, right, uh, just a couple days later, they make it official. So there had been this conversation about what the new bridge was going to be called. Uh, one of the names actually was the Bicentennial Bridge, which I think is fitting, uh, certainly because of the time period. But then there's this movement to name it after Gilchrist, right? Albert Gilchrist, who had spent a great number, a great deal of time in Punta Gorda, had strong connections to the community here, uh, and who had served as governor of Florida from 1909 to 1913. And so here, right at the bottom of the page, the bridge's name official. Legislation authorizing the naming of the new bridge over the Peace River, the Albert W. Gilchrist Bridge, has been successfully adopted by the legislature. The bridge was so named in honor of Gilchrist, who is a former Charlotte County native who served as governor of Florida from 1909 to 1913. The new bridge will be formally dedicated by the local officials and dignitaries during the bicentennial activities planned for July 4th. Although the bridge is not expected to be completed and open to traffic before August or September, the dedication will be held anyway, which is interesting. Um, you know, where they're, they understand that they're not going to meet that deadline, that the bridge will ha require some finalization, some tweaks before it can fully open to traffic. But they want to time it, right? They, and, and we understand this. 
um, you know, this, this certainly happens uh, with even dedicating of things today where you want to time it with a particular date, with a particular event, and so you hold it even if all the pieces aren't necessarily in place. Then on July 3rd, and there won't be a newspaper, there, there's no newspaper on July 4th, so this is, this is going to be the last coverage before the event, and then I have some coverage after the event. So this is July 3rd, fish fry dedication lead July 4th activity. Charlotte County residents will have a day full of 4th of July activities beginning at 11.30 a.m. tomorrow when the Punta Gorda Kiwanis Club starts serving for its annual fish fry and ending with a special bicentennial fireworks display scheduled to begin after dark around 8.30 p.m. at Gilchrist Park. Right, so here you have this new bridge, the Albert W. Gilchrist Bridge, you have Gilchrist Park, right, so we can see the strong connections uh, and the importance that, that Gilchrist has to the community. Sarah Ruiz dedicating the Albert W. Gilchrist Bridge will begin at the center span at 1.30 p.m. A boatcade of approximately 200 boats will release 2,000 2, red, white, and blue bicentennial balloons donated by Punta Gorda's First National Bank. And a flag 40 feet long and 20 feet wide made by Miss Lavena, Lavena Day, Miss Lavena Days will be unfurled for mark, to mark the conclusion of the first part of the dedication. So this is a full event. This is a full, I mean, think about what you do on the 4th of July today and right, there's always fireworks, there's parades, but they just have their hands full. I mean, you would have been able to do something at every hour of every, you know, the entire day here, whether it's, you know, the parades to celebrate the bicentennial, to celebrate the bridge, the bridge dedication, then you have the fish fry. I mean, this is very, very exciting for the community. And then finally on July 6th, following the event, uh, you have coverage here. Charlotte celebrates in style. Twas indeed the glorious fourth in Charlotte. I do love that they use the word twas there. Definitely a hearkening back here. From noon, uh, from before noon until after sundown, the residents were busy with barbecues and parties, fish fries, dedication of the new Albert W. Gilchrist Bridge over the Peace River, a parade, and a fireworks display. And they have, and it's it's not very good. I won't I won't show because you really can't see it. But there's a photo here that's showing the boatcade um, passing underneath uh, the new bridge. And it says, boats from more than 200 groups and people in the dedication of the new Albert Gilchrist Bridge during the 4th of July ceremonies. This photograph by Barry Gold, courtesy of the Charlotte County Civilian Air Patrol, shows the old Punta Gorda Bridge in the foreground, the Baron Collier Bridge in the center, and the Gilchrist Bridge at the top, uh, as participants of the boatcade make patterns with their churning wakes. Um, you know, and I think that, Kind of an interesting note to leave this on. So when the Albert Gilchrist Bridge is completed, right, the old, the 1931 Baron Collier Bridge remains, right, because now the idea is we're going to have a northbound and a southbound. Interestingly, though, that 1921 bridge was actually still standing. Now, it had fallen into huge disrepair. We're talking 50 years later, right? Um, parts of it were crumbling, Right, things of that nature. And, and there are articles, and I didn't print them and I didn't read from them, but there are articles around the same time that talk about that bridge needs to go. It is a hazard, right? Fishermen were going out onto it and fishing off of it, which I'm sure was great, but it was a safety hazard. And so what you're going to actually see happen in the, in the wake of this new bridge is you're going to see that bridge completely dismantled. There's a small, I believe, section of it that's left that's kind of part of the breakwater over there um, but that is completely dismantled and taken down uh, so then you have the two bridges right and not that long after this in 1983 you're going to have the new Baron Collier Bridge that will replace the old one the old one will be dismantled and part of that actually is still standing today uh, as a fishing dock right so it, it's so interesting here and I think you know over the course of this year we've talked about a lot of things related to Charlotte County. Uh, and we've talked about some things that are critical to Charlotte County, the railroads early on, but these bridges really are critical to Charlotte County and to Charlotte County's development. So uh, I hope you enjoyed my potpourri lecture today. Um, we will be back next month uh, to talk about the 1980s. Uh, and so please join us then.